Evans is a 29-year-old solicitor, as once I wrote in a bio, but I think that's very robotic. It's robotic and does not explain who I am. I believe that I'm a person who is very inquisitive. I like to understand people. I like to understand knowledge and thing, how things work. Um, I'm a Christian, first of all. I love Jesus and I'm saved. And I believe that that's the cornerstone and the foundation of everything that's been from the beginning till now. And, um, and I base my life on that. And more so in these years that I've led up to here, I've understood that truth and known that that is what I want, that that, that is the conviction over my life. Welcome guys, thank you for tuning in. Um, my name is Evans and welcome to Connect and this is my story. Amazing. So how, how, how did it all start? How, how did you even know about Australia and was there a background to that story before you even jetted in or took that flight to Australia so that you can come study law? Was there a bit of a background or was just the, straight from high school to Australia? There is, there is a bit of a background, to be honest. Um, starting from 2005, the talk of Australia was always sort of floating around in our family. So um, basically, we had it from the very weirdest of circumstances. We had it from, a, from, a, from an owner of a suit shop told us, oh, my son is in Australia. He's going to do this. He's an accountant there, blah, blah, blah. And we didn't think much of it. And uh, in, that, in, that time, in that time, my parents were not, um, we, we were just trying to figure life out. So one of our family members went to Australia, came to Australia and uh, for further studies. And from then on, we got to see Australia from a third hand or, or a very, a person said something about Australia. So we didn't have a first hand glance of what Australia is. But we knew of it. We understood what comes out of Australia, what happens in Australia. We understood the stories that are there just from a third-hand perspective. But so for me to get to Australia, it was not, it was not a straight shot from high school to, to, to uni. So I, went, um, I was born and raised in, in, in Kenya. I grew up in Nairobi, in Donholm. So my name is Adoni. East London. Islando, um, and then throughout the years in 2002, we moved over. To, we moved over to Lavington, and we stayed there until I was in in high school. Um, I attended Strathmore School in in Nairobi, and that's where I got my foundation. Um, shout out to every Strathmore, Strathmorean, <laughs> Coco. I know I'll get a lot of hate for that, but whatever. <laughs> so yeah, Strathmore High School is where I was. Um, I really valued that school. It taught me how to be the person I am today. We being taught to be virtuous, being taught how to be a person who stands for what you believe in, even though whatever faith you're from, contrary to popular belief, um, even though Strathmore is Catholic based, they accepted everyone and they taught you to stick to your guns. So stick to whatever you believe in and stick to know, you know what is true. And so through that, I learned how to be, to speak for myself, to understand myself as a person. And that sort of helped me later on in life. So finished form four in 2011. And the question is, what do you do after that? The question of Australia never came up at all. No one, no one suggested Australia because at that time, for me, it was... My, my thinking and my belief was that I'm meant to be a lawyer. I'll be a lawyer. I'll be a corporate lawyer. And that's what I want to be. It's not because I watch Suits, but it's because from a very young age, I know that I knew that I wanted to do something that impacts businesses, that impacts people's lives and to help businesses grow and understand that, that whole dynamic of business and that personal relationship. And so I saw being a corporate lawyer would be suit me best and more so in the technology field. So I went to university. I went to Strathmore Law School again, um, which was a four year degree, um, a four year degree, got to, to become a lawyer uh, in 2016 and went to Kenya School of Law, did a two year torture series of, <laughs> of exams, <laughs> but we made it out. We made it out. Started working as a lawyer in a firm in, in a, at 
second tier firm in Nairobi. So when you talk about second tier firms and first tier terms, in a law perspective, first tier terms are firms are very are firms that are highly classified. They do highly classified and exclusive jobs. So they get the fifty million dollar contracts, they get the, the hundred million dollar contracts and they're the bragging rights. Two second tier firms are those well known and prestigious firms, but they do more boutique or very specialized fields. So I was fortunate enough to work in such an environment for two years. Got a lot of mentorship and I think at that time I understood my my role and what I wanted to do. And so I said I'll take a chance on myself basically put my my faith in a bag and came to australia and came to do my masters in Mel university of melbourne yeah wow wow how how was that now that transition how was that journey now coming coming from kenya you've already practiced you've already seen what to work in a law for me and now yeah. you're coming to be a student how was that transition for you it it was very i think juxtapositional because it wasn't it wasn't straight cut Basically, you're coming from, you started off in university theory. You put it into practice for two years. That's not enough for anyone coming into law. So coming from, coming from having a full-time job, coming from having a, like, a structured, a structured nine to five, doing, doing practice and dealing with clients and going back to school again, that was a big dissonance. So you sort of lose yourself in that process, but also find your own voice because also I was learning to adapt to a new system of learning. In Kenya, you're, you're taught how to read, cram, and do an exam. In Australia, you're taught, how, you're taught how to find the information, read for yourself, understand it, and tell me why you think it's right. Because that's the whole situation when it comes to, to education. Um, so in, in that two years of of doing a master's, um, I did a master's of law in technology for one year, and then did another master's of commercial law. So it's a double double master's degree, which was I won't recommend if you're not <laughs> if you don't want to study, I won't recommend it. So in that in that era, I found a way an understanding of actually expressing my own opinions. If you if you if you've been back here, back home or in Africa, the education system is most of most of the time that your opinion doesn't matter. In in Australia, when you come to a master's level program, it's more of your opinion matters, and why does it matter? We want to hear your thoughts. They are not they are not invalid, whether they're right or wrong. We want to hear them. So that also sort of put me in a bit of a bind because I had to understand how to find my voice. From a, from an educational point of view. Amazing. And, and, and while you're studying, how, how was it to integrate, you know, in this culture? Because you're coming from a different <laughs> culture and now you've come to this Australian culture, which is very diverse. How was that for you? It was, it was hard. It was hard. To be honest, it was hard. You, you come to, in your life, you've lived with Africans. <laughs> you've lived knowing two languages, two, three languages, which are Swahili, English, and your mother tongue. And you're coming to a country where you're meeting white people, you're meeting Asians, you're meeting all people from every type of race, which you never thought you'd ever meet. And, and in some ways, it was, very, it was like finding that cultural shift. Good thing is that between the two of, between when you interact with people, you are sort of in the same boat. You're in the same boat, you have a very, you have a very, uh, you have a very close-knit close-knit bond because you have similar circumstances. I was very fortunate enough when I came to Australia to live in a, in a university accommodation. So you are, you are fully immersed in culture. So you're fully immersed with people. You, you find yourself talking to people who you never thought you'd talk to. The first friend I made was not Kenyan. It was actually a Sri, a Sri Lankan. Her name is Nimna. If she's watching, <laughs> I hope you're doing well in your PhD. You're not, and you're not going mad. But anyways, <laughs> she, she's she was one of the first few people I, I I met I met I met in in Melbourne. Um, just randomly, we found out we took the same class, and till now those relationships are what 
built me up to to this point and i really value those relationships so finding yourself sort of putting yourself out there and putting yourself in a situation where you're uncomfortable and meet new people that's the best way to actually integrate it's not it's not just sticking putting pulling yourself inside and being introverted it's putting yourself out there and saying look here i am i'm from kenya where are you from what do you want to know about me and i'll tell you more about me and i'll tell you more about my country i want to know about yours too amazing that's 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 a very good topic that you've raised which actually has very key lessons but now we're gonna before we finish the study part i have two questions yeah. one in australia you have to there's a 20 hour limit where you have to work yeah. so to at least sustain yourself what what kind of jobs did you do while yeah. you studied law and how did you balance between socializing work and study and what just give an example of what you used to do for work at that time okay um i am a photographer and i've been so since 2015. so three months before i came to australia i sat down and and asked myself okay we we've heard stories of australia we've heard um being a student is not easy it's not easy to get a job so what are we going to do what are we starting what would we want to do or what jobs can we actually get first of all was to look at the work experience what work work rights that you're given it's 20 hours per week or 40 hours every two weeks how do you work ar across that i came to find out early from my research when i was still back home that i can only do casual jobs so i started now looking three months before coming at the jobs i can do so i was al already on seek.com from kenya already on linkedin trying to reach out to people you're already on job boards like on Jora, I was already on even the U the university job board. I was already there trying to look for jobs. And I was fortunate enough to find that the University of Melbourne had a, a program that they were running for international students to integrate them into the university to work in various fields. So I, by faith, I just put in an application, put in an application to start for, for, a, for, for a photography job. And, and the reason why it, for doing that is because I knew I had a talent and a skill that I could sort of monetize much better than I did back home. Uh, so, so I put in I put in an application to become a photographer slash videographer in one of the communications unit in the university. My my heart was to become a lawyer, but I knew I couldn't become I couldn't practice law until I got my practicing certificate. So I just bit the pill. And said I'll put in my chips and and do and, and just apply for for the internship program at the uni. Now, luckily, when I got when I got to the university, I think it was like three weeks into my into my first classes, I went for my first interview. I went for the for the first interview for the for the internship program. Did well, passed the first round. Second round got I got um I got eliminated because. I was not what they were looking for at that point. It was a bit disheartening because it's your first rejection in a new country. You don't know what to do. But not less than 30 minutes later, the person who rejected me called me and said, hey, I know you've rejected you, but there's an opportunity that's come up in another sector of the university. They're looking for a videographer. Please send your CV. In my mind, I was already like, I didn't get the job I really wanted. So why should I even try? And so she told me, send your CV in the next three days by 5 p.m. on the 15th of March. Let's see what happens. I said, nah, I, I'd, I sort of said, no, I'm not going to do this. I'll try and look for something else. I, I, did, I did a few applications. Nothing came through. And on the last day at 4.30 on 15th of March, I put in my application and said, you know what? Let's just give it a shot. And no, no less than seven days later, I was called for a job. Told you, told you. So you're starting on 11th of April. You're becoming. A, you're going to be the one of the university photographers for a project that they're doing. Yeah, come through. And that's how I started in in Australia. Started with my skills, what I'd learned from back home, the basic things of just being a photographer and building up your skills. The small jobs I did back in Kenya, doing small weddings, uh, doing traditional weddings, doing graduations. All those culminated into me actually getting into the job market here. Amazing. So, yeah. so, so before we go to the how you balanced, 
what what advice do you have for those people who have skills but coming here and sort of just throwing the skills away and not even trying to to utilize the skills they they have in the first place it, what it sells in australia skills sell people are not looking for high flying or or something that high flying um marketable skills they're looking for the basic skills can you do the job do you have a track record do you have experience have you done even if the menial thing can you write can you write a short story you used to be we used to write compositions and stories in and essays in school can you do that can you do research can you do even the menial job of even even knitting people there are jobs out there that we don't really have we don't really have information about because it's not shared yeah amazing 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 so the last question on that part how did you balance it all because here you yeah. have to work here you have to study and you still have to make friends how did that balance <laughs> to be honest i'd say it was god it i was fortunate enough to have a job in the university that's the the my my supervisors were were cognizant that i was actually doing a masters they told me we sat down on the uh, and just basically laid laid it bare to them the matter of communication in australia is very important it laid it bare to them i am doing a masters degree this is my schedule can you work around that schedule and they said totally so they i used to do 3 days 3 days in the office monday wednesday and friday come in do edits do interviews shoot whatever i shoot edit whatever i edit help around in the office and then go home i used to do that for about 3 uh we used to we used to have a we used to have a formula for the international students so it was 767 767 translates to 20 hours a week and that and that's how we used to calculate our time sheets so 7 hours on monday 6 hours on on wednesday 7 hours on friday and that's how i i built to that i be, i built up and balanced that and then the extra two days would be doing assignments would be attending classes would be whatever i wanted to do so i got a chance chances to travel around australia been to regional australia all around um i got to make new friends i got to meet new people went for dancing at one point which i thought was mad but fine i went for dancing <laughs> so <laughs> I tried everything. Went tried joining the Melbourne Rugby Club. Epic fail because I wasn't 18 anymore. I couldn't do what I used to do. I said, "You know what? It's good. Life happens and you can just Continue. go through it." I mean, I, I I'm in Australia. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to have this opportunity anymore. I'm sure this this question um someone will kick me if I don't ask this question. But someone who's looking to study uh, law in Australia. Mm. How is it to study law in Australia? Is it easy? Is it something you would advise someone out there to do? So this is this is yeah. after your own experience. So after my own experience. Yeah. Okay. There are two levels to it. Number one, are you starting out from high school? Or are you starting out are you coming in as an already established lawyer or a requalifying lawyer? If you're starting out as a uni student, I'd say go for it. It's it's one of the best things to ever do. I'd advise you to actually look at doing a double degree so a double major in law and something else because Australia gives you that opportunity to do that the Australian educational system I know of Monash University only gives you a, an opportunity to to have a major in both in something else and that doesn't disrupt your whole learning of the law and so One thing I'd say is that you should be careful it's a lot of reading. I know it's stereotypical but there's a lot of reading. You read cases, you read cases, you read policies, you read legislation and you get to appreciate how people actually write and your your language changes, your perception to things change, your understanding of how the world works changes day in day out as you move towards that because it's like the bible says whatever you take in is whatever you give out yeah and at the end of the day whatever you take in, the much cases you take in you give you you you, you start spilling out cases even to your random friend you start talking about oh there is this case that we had about this person who actually just who broke his leg because he one of those weird ones we used to do all that 
you start talking in Latin phrases. But that's the beauty about it. You get to learn something new every day when you do law. If you're coming as a requalified lawyer, you're coming into the country as a as an already established lawyer with a few years of experience, the road for your requalification starts from when before you get on the plane. Because you're not you're not a university bachelor student. You are a graduate student and the responsibility on you is a bit much is a, is is much higher. The pathway to becoming a solicitor in Australia is much for a for a gra for a for a for a bachelor student is straightforward. You go do your uni, enjoy life three years, three and a half years, three four years. If you're doing a double major, four years. If you're doing an honors degree, four years. And the next thing is that the system helps you get to become a solicitor one six months later after you graduate. Easy. But for a qualifying qualifying advocate, no, that's not the case. It starts before you you enter you enter you enter Australia, and that's one thing I wish I knew. Or I wish I take I'd taken much active steps towards, because I did not I was not convinced as much whether I'd wanted to stay in Australia or not. It's only after I came is when I realized oh, I can stay in Australia because I have this research research, research is the basis of everything. So. Number one, find out which state you're going to. If you're going to Victoria, there's, a, there's, a, there's an admissions or a legal body that actually governs your whole accreditation. Accreditation For Victoria, it's the uh, Victorian legal... Um, sorry, Vic, uh, I misspoke. It's the Victorian Law Association admission, Admissions Board. Legal ad, sorry, Victoria Legal Admissions Board, VLA. VLS, VLAB. I'm not sure about the names because I can't remember them now. In in Queensland, it's different. In New South Wales, it's different. In in WA, it's different. So find out where you're going and find the body that actually does your accreditation. The next thing is to basically go do an assessment. They they take your transcripts and tell you, okay, have you done these courses? Uh, there's what we call the priestly eleven in 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 Australia. Basically, your your basics that every law student should know. Do you have criminal law, civil law, criminal procedure, civil procedure? Have you done property, constitutional law? And you find that if you're coming from a Commonwealth country, a com a country that was colonized by the British, your your subjects that you did in law school might be similar to the ones they did in they, they are doing in Australia and you have to convince the board that those those subjects align and are similar. Thankfully when I did it when I was here, I was able to I was able I was able to convince them that most of the subjects I did were actually valid. So if you if you don't meet the threshold of if you don't meet the threshold of getting of of convincing them that these subjects are the same they tell you do the 11 basically they're telling you do another degree so it's up to you to tell them this is what i've done in school these are the details these are the these this is the form that this is the form that it took and this is what we learned and give it give that information to them that's what i did under with the help of other people that's what i did and i showed them that i con i was able to manage to convince them I got nine exemptions. I only did two subjects. When you get that assessment, you're told to do two subjects, constitutional law and property. That's what I was told. Next step is to go find a university that can give you online classes to actually do these, do these subjects while you're actually doing your master's on top because you don't have time to sleep. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you don't have time to sleep because you're coming here to Australia to do a master's or whatever you, or whatever degree you're doing, the me, the moment you step into Australia, you've already enrolled in your first in your first subject to qualify to qualify to sort of standardize your your accreditation your your, your yeah. accreditation yeah, and so you get into that, make sure you get it, do your research, find the proper university. I'd I'd say look into New South Wales universities and look into Victorian universities. They're flexible on online learning. 
and then next and then next you do the exams you finish you get you get your your confirmation from the universities and you send it to the board they approve you and now you go to what they call uh, practical legal training which is a six month it's a six month uh, training where you're told this is how you do a letter of demand this is how you do a, a, a you file a claim you file um, a petition you do all those things whatever a lawyer needs to do and learn and so if you've been to if you've been a lawyer already these are things you've already done they are very junior things but you have to go through them or if you have more experience go and ask for a further exemption i've known people who've, who've gotten further exemptions i've been told you only need to do two units in in the practical legal training after that you get your your good standing with the, with the board and then you get you get you get sworn in as a lawyer we're going to take a break and we'll be right back i've been told to say that <laughs> Welcome back. I've been told to say that. <laughs> Heavens. So now, did you finish your studies and are you practicing? Did you get accredited? Are you practicing law and where are you in your career now? All those answers? Yes, I did. <laughs> but there's a story behind all that. So um, I came to Australia in 2019. Did I did my Master's of Laws in, in Technology and financial transactions at the time uh, Melbourne Uni was the seventh best law school in the world that's why I came over and I was able to finish that course within a year by December of 2019 I was able to do my last unit and then I enrolled again into a master's of commercial law and so in 2020 around February is when I was starting my first class then as we know 2020 COVID hits borders locked down everything goes online so at this point it's an international international students we were suffering jobs were cut so i lost my job also uh in in april but then you ha i had to turn on my thinking cap again be aggressive and go out there and look for whatever job i could get because it's a matter of life and death at this point and um, so I was able to get a job with the university accommodation I was working with. I was helping out in admin staff at the, at the offices. Mark you, this time I was not, I was not um, requalified as a, as a lawyer. So in, in July of 2020 is when I was supposed to start my, uh, start my practical legal training because I was able to do all those courses I had mentioned before online. I'd gotten everything. Everything was tick, tick, tick. Bad thing is that we were we had the ring of steel around Victoria, and then we had we had uh, we had online classes which were far distance to each other. So that sort of affected how I was able to 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 function. But thank God I was I was in a community that was helping me out, and I was able to to do my classes when when I needed to, and then. Unfortunately, in this time, I broke my leg. In June, in June 2020, I broke, I, I, I call it broke, breaking my leg, but it was a Achilles tendon. My Achilles tendon snapped. I was, I was trying to do some community sports, got an injury. Basically, now it was a six-month rehab. But as I said, we don't have any time to sleep. <laughs> so I had to soldier on. So I did my master's from bed. So I was, I was, I had to go on bed, bed rest because I had to go for surgery, go on bed rest. So this is July, 2020, go on, on bed rest, do my classes on, on, on um, from, from bed and basically do everything, everything there while, while I'm recuperating. At the same time, July, I had to start my practical legal training. So I also had to do that on top of everything else of physiotherapy and recovering. So that was also con concurrently going on. And then also I had to go back to work in September. And if anyone knows, when you have a, 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 a tendon rupture, you don't really walk well. So I had to walk everywhere I was going. So I was hobbling on crutches for a bit, basically surviving the whole situation. 
But thank God in December, by whatever miracle happened, I was able to graduate and do everything I needed to do and actually pass my, my classes not well enough. I, I spoke to my lecturers later on, but actually exemplary enough to actually just make a good result of the time that was there, considering all those circumstances and factors that had happened. And so I got admitted in, um, by the time it was December 2020, we were coming out of lockdown. I was able to work again, was able to finish my studies, or was able to finish my accreditation. And then I got admitted as a solicitor in March, in 1st of March, yeah, 2021. And then still at that time, doing what I needed to do, went out there looking for a, looking for a job. And that was a whole other process. Because <laughs> now you're, as an international graduate student, you have, you're starting as a, a clean slate. So whatever experience you have from Kenya, I kid you not, no one is going to look at it. That's the, that's the bottom line truth. No one is going to look at it in terms of can you do the work. As I said before, in Australia, it's much of have you done the work? Can we get a reference for you doing this work? Can we actually trust you with this work? And so that, that's the narrative I was always hearing when I was getting rejection letters from law firms, rejections from interviews, that we have found people with better experience. And so, thankfully, I was able to find one of the law firms in, in Melbourne. It was a small law firm that was starting up. Uh, the name is Dark Legal. Um, I thank God for this, uh, for the principal, the principal solicitor there. Her name is Alicia Dark that uh, she gave me the best experience. Like she, she took me under her wing, taught me whatever she could ta teach me and exposed me to as much, as much litigation, litigation as, as I could, as I could get. So I was doing construction matters. I was, drew, I was doing um, family disputes sometimes, criminal disputes. I was doing land transactions, anything I could get my hands on, she gave it to me. She walked me through that, even though I was still, um, even though I was still, I was still very junior. And then from then on in around May, so I got, I started working with her in December, 2020 and sort of before I was already admitted. So she trained me up as a trainee solicitor till I was admitted. And then in May, 2021, I, 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 I resigned from that job, went to a to a regional law firm in in Melbourne, worked there as um, as a junior solicitor, and so it was now a matter of navigating Australia from the perspective of you are a graduate lawyer, you have so many experience years back home that you're not using, but you have to start from the ground up, and that's one thing that people don't usually tell you. You have to start from the ground up. When you're coming as a master's student and a graduate student, you have to start from the ground up. It doesn't matter how many years you've had before, you have to start from the ground up. And that's the, and that's, that's the perseverance. You have to persevere that. For just one year to two years, you have to persevere that, that learning process because you're reforming your thoughts and your mind on how to work with people. Because the Australian culture, as we know, it is much different from what we have from wherever we are coming from. And so we have to understand that we are, we are stepping into a new threshold of um, responsiveness, of office interactions, of office politics also. So that, that, that whole thing. So fortunately, I was able to get into a good firm that actually sort of trained me and uh, exposed me to, to a, lot, a lot of work. When I say a lot of work, a lot of work. Where are you and what next for you in your career? What are, where am I? Yeah, so what next? At the moment, I'm working as a legal counsel with a legal counsel with a public company in, 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 in Australia. So a, a public company is a company that may be listed on the, on the ASX. What we do, we do a lot of uh, horticulture and farming and agricultural um, activities around in and around Australia and even overseas and so I do a lot of advising and corporate law so we do a lot of uh, drafting of contracts 
review of contracts and um, and also handle general legal advice for companies. And so this is the work I was sort of similarly doing in a as a as a junior lawyer back in Kenya. So I was I was doing all these things in the law firm, but now I'm able to translate it to business to business and also business outcomes that that uh, that I'm handling. I'm able to interact with people who are in high places and see how they function. I'm able to see how a CEO works. I'm able to see how the CFO uh, hedges against risk. I'm able to see how um, a legal, uh, like general counsels and um, and heads of legal departments actually handle um, crises and also legal risk in a business. And that's where I see myself going. I see myself going into more corporate roles and understanding what what all this is about and um and yeah and it's 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 an interesting job it's an interesting job because you interact more with people it's it's more of a personal interaction of understanding people and where they're coming from other as opposed to be being in a law firm where it's billable hours money 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 this is what i want can you get it for me this is more of this is our goal. We are heading to this position. We want our financial position next year to be better. What do we do as a legal department to get to that level? What can we do from a non a non um, what do you call it a non income generating unit? Because legal departments and companies are not generating units. A non legal gen a non income generating unit. What can we do to actually step it up? to make the business actually thrive. Amazing, amazing. So, uh, back to my question. Yeah. Mental health. Going through all this, there's always that, you know, drain. And how did you survive or how did you go through all this? What really, what is your biggest support and how did you go through all this? Yeah. As I mentioned before, I had family in, in Australia. I think that grounded me. And number two, it was, I'd say God. <laughs> that was... <laughs> that was the main threshold. If it wasn't for God, I would be, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be mad, and I'd, I'd have gone mad somewhere as, at some point, <laughs> done something to someone or something else, so that I can let it all out. Because at that point, it was a pent up anger and frustration in everybody in Melbourne, in everybody in the world. We all, we are all locked down. We can't do anything. There was that frustration and and basically disappointment that we could be living our lives but we are here stuck and we can't do anything about it and so my mental health suffered a bit especially going through all that going through a broken leg being online online classes and having having lowered income it was a bit stressful but thank god for prayers prayers of the people around me thank god for the prayers that i prayed in desperation and now they're coming to be fulfilled thank god for the people who check up on you regularly and people and friends who actually surround you even people who are not family actually saying hi how are you doing are you okay and through that i was able to go to actually get to the next level amazing yeah. let's talk about an outlet what what maybe what what one thing did you pick up that helped you not to smash windows, <laughs> but to sort of let it all out. Let it all out. Well, um, as I said, I, I, I was a photographer in, in Kenya, and that's what got me my first job. The story about photography for me is that it's more about expression rather than what I can get from a scene. So when you take a photograph, it's what does it tell you? So I was a street photo. I, I was a street photographer in Kenya. I tried it in Kenya street photography in twenty between twenty twelve and twenty nineteen when I left. It was illegal, like going out and taking street photographs. It was illegal, but I did it with a couple of friends. I was able to get out there and just tell stories of people through portraits and portraits and also landscape photography and cityscape. And I translated that into Australia. I did photography in Australia, street photography for a bit, then went into lockdown. And in that time, I was able to sort of hone my skills. 
and do more research and do more creative outlets. So I went into 3D art, started create, learning how to use free, free software like, like Blender 3D, which is very good for animations. I did a few animations. I was able to take photographs from my apartment window very conceptual they've never been released but i did those things so as a, as an outlet and at this time i would say my spirit was very alive to the fact of what was going around and in my mind i'd say i'd say god put this put this understanding of mental health much more into perspective because i never dealt with it previously but in this time, God showed me, look, you are going through it. Someone else is going through it. All of you need to share your stories. And for me, that, that, that had been the impression from 2020 that I would want at one point in my life to do a documentary or a short film about mental health. And so in 2020, we're in 2023, right? Yeah. 2022, I was... Um, I got this idea or vision that I should make a platform for people to express what they felt from COVID. So to express and curate what has happened during COVID. Where were you before? Where were you during? Where are you after? And whatever I, I get from people, I curate it and put it out there. It's not for, for me to make money. It's not for me to actually put put myself on the map because I've given up on on becoming famous or a famous photographer. Nah, that one I gave up because I knew that that's not what I wanted to do. For me, it's building people up, building communities, telling people stories, showing them that there's there's hope, and whatever hope you lie on, that's what you, you need to grasp at the end of the day and be steadfast. Amazing. And yeah. how's the creativity now going? And, you know, what are you seeing maybe in the next few months or future? What is the future looking like in creativity? Because remember, yeah. you're, doing, you're practicing law yeah. and you have the creativity side. So exactly. how is the creativity side looking for you? It's looking good. It's a slow moving Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> it's a slow moving Ferrari. And the reason is that I say it is because I know it's a good idea. So basically, I started a platform called And Then. Basically, it's, it's a platform to share stories. My idea is that we're going to tell, we're going to curate videos of people around me first and people everywhere of what, what were you before COVID, what happened during COVID, how's your mental health, and how are you moving on? That's the main story. Nothing else. But as time goes on, the theme, the theme will change because we have changed. We have evolved from COVID and that's not the story anymore. But who are we and what are we as people? Where are we finding our identity from? And so the main overarching theme is to, find, to say, what's your identity? Where do you place your identity? Have you been acceptance? Are you looking for acceptance? And where are you going to find your acceptance? And, um, and so, and then it's supposed to be that platform for people to share their stories. And uh, as I said, it's not something to be famous for. I'm doing it out of my own pocket. I'm doing it out of my own time. And so I have to sort of be purposeful and intentional to make time to go out there and see people. I'm an introvert by nature. I hate talking to people. I don't like it. <laughs> it's relaxing. But I am I am out there and making and making stuff happen. Because you know how long it took you to get me to be here. <laughs> it took so long. It took long. So I'm very I'm very alive to that that I if I'm supposed to go do this vision and dream, that's what I'm gonna do. I have to go out there and do my best. Advice yeah. to so, advice, so what, yeah. what advice would you have for young people? Number one, I'm too young <laughs> to be giving advice, still going through it. And number two is that God is a foundation, should be the foundation of your life. At any point in your life, prayer and supplication to God is what keeps you running and keeps you that engine. It's like it's like oil in your engine 
without oil in an in without refined oil in an engine that engine will run but it will run for a finite moment but with god and putting yourself and abiding in him daily abiding and moving towards him he says draw near unto me and i'll draw near unto you god does not draw near to you first you run to him because we need him he doesn't need us we need him and so that daily pursuit of of god through christ jesus that's what that's what i'll say is the second is what is the foundation of my life and should be the foundation of anyone's life number 3 seek information do your research every day whatever it is always be keen to learn something from someone whatever it might look like and that always sets you apart be alive to every situation uh the people around me always have this phrase always be switched on to whatever's happening keep your ears on the ground keep your head running and always have fun while you're doing it you you can't live life doing something you don't have fun in for many people for many people reading a whole case is not fun for me that's the fun part for me that's where i am excited to see to see what the law can do for people taking the law and manipulating it to what you want it to be is the best thing that i can ever do and so enjoy what you do and number f- and number 4 just make friends be kind don't be do, don't live life don't don't let this the sun go down on your anger be happy about the circumstances and know that god is always there amazing 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 so now final remarks and how can people maybe follow whatever you're doing or anything that you have to say as your final remarks so final remarks final remarks um yeah i'm very reachable on instagram my my handle is musao evans musao underscore evans that's that's my personal page that's where i post my photography when i feel like i'm inspired um for my platform that i'm working on it's called and then so it's and then a u underscore so you'll find it there the profile picture is just and then you'll see it uh yeah so if you have a story if you have anything that you want to share i'm happy to hear you out i'm happy to come and see you happy for you to just tell your story of how how your foundation is and so and always just getting inspiration from people yeah basically that and uh thank you for watching this episode with me also awesome. good <laughs>